Project Configuration, Developing a Network Device Naming Convention. By the time you're done here, you will be able to design and configure a naming convention for your Switch network. When I first got into networking, learning how to change the name of the devices is one of the first things that you learn. And it's simple, it's a single command, and you move on from there. And it wasn't until years later that I discovered, you know what? Knowing how to set a name is the easy part. Knowing what to set it to is one that takes a little bit of thought. And I have to start off with the question, what's in a name? And the answer is nothing and yet everything at the same time. Meaning there's no functional difference whether you name a device intelligently or no name at all of what it does. It's still gonna run the same speed, it's still gonna have the same features, but yet it's everything because it helps you identify that device uniquely in the whole network. So what you name that device can either make your life a lot easier or a lot more confusing. This name right here is a screen cap that I actually pulled from the Cisco SG300 that we were configuring earlier in the series. And I like this because it names itself out of the box, switch followed by the last six digits of the MAC address, which is on a sticker on the back of the switch. So if we happen to log in, I could go, oh, it's DC86D0, and I could walk around looking at different, oh, 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 that's the one. That's the one that is, right? So there's no replacing good documentation, no matter what naming convention you use. However, a good naming convention can really help. Now, in the same token, there is no golden rule of naming. There's no best practice that you'll find out on the internet of here's what you should name all your devices, but there are some naming conventions that are better than others. These first two names down here are themes, meaning the network administrator either likes Sesame Street or The Matrix, and so they started naming their network devices after characters. And that naming convention works, but relies on good documentation, right? Because if you log in and you haven't been into this network for a year, and see that you've logged into the Neo switch, that means nothing to you, unless you have a network diagram sitting next to you saying, Neo is the core switch of the network. Elmo happens to be his backup. This one feels more technical, however, it's exactly the same thing. Some people will go and just start numbering the switches, switch one, switch two, switch three, which leaves you in the same place. When you log in, you know that you're on switch three, but you have no idea where that fits into the grand scheme of things. You'd have to have that good documentation sitting right beside you. Right here is where we start stepping into something a little better. This switch is named TX-2. TX represents the location. So just by looking at that, I go, oh, okay, that is a switch in Texas. And likely it's the second switch in that location. Now it's not much better because that launches me right back here going, okay, well, what does that mean? I need a network diagram of that Texas location, but at least I know I'm in Texas. Now I know you might be thinking, good grief, Jeremy, don't you know you're in Texas if you're managing a switch in Texas? Not necessarily. I'll tell you what, networking is a borderless technology. So as you start getting into more and more consulting, you'll be in international organizations managing devices that you have no idea where they are. And since everything is so well connected, it's easy to jump from Texas to Japan to Australia. So over here, I'm just gonna label these guys good, meaning they're all of the same genre, they uniquely identify the switch, so they're one step up from having no name at all. But to have any idea what they mean, you have to have documentation wrapped around them. These are better. Just like the list on the left, this list is all of the same genre. It's really just the size of the company that dictates which one of these you'd go with, along with what your preference is. I would say this first one is probably almost perfect for the organization that we're working with. This says the name of the organization, or at least the abbreviation of it, RT is the name of the company. Then we have what office it's in. That would be suite one or suite four. Then we have switch one in that suite, switch two in that suite, so that we're able to differentiate at least the location of the building that we're in. If you take this, combine it with some good documentation, as well as a sticker on the front of the switch, you are home free. This would be well if this is your own organization and you're not really managing other organizations. This one is the same style thing, it's just you've started a coding system for your organizations. So for instance, maybe 1001 is the first customer that you have. And that might line up to a spreadsheet somewhere that lines up to their invoice numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see how these things can tie together. Then right here is building one and switch five. So really the only difference between these two is, is this one organization or do you have a coding system for multiple organizations? This might be a large organization. Here's how this might read. This switch is in North America, Phoenix, Arizona, site number one. On that campus, it's building two, floor five, closet one, rack five of that closet. Now that's intense, right? So this would be maybe a college campus that 
is located in Phoenix, Arizona with all kinds of buildings. And when I walk into that building, which happens to be building number two, I go up to the fifth floor and on that floor, I walk into a network room and on that it has the title closet one and inside of there is many different racks of equipment. And I should be able to walk over to rack number five and find this device. Now, I know some of you might be like, oh man, that's way overkill. Who would have something like that? I'm telling you, if you're managing a network that large and you're used to seeing names like that, it's pretty handy. The key is, are you able to follow the code? This last style integrates a little bit of functionality into the name. Let me clear all this off. At this point in the series, you've seen a little switch design and you've seen that I've been labeling some things as a core switch. And that just represents the switch that everything connects to. Those things that connect to it are known as access switches. So as your business grows, you'll have a small core, maybe that's just a couple devices, and a whole bunch of access switches scattered throughout the network. Thus, you're starting to see the name. This could be that customer number that you're using before, access switch number five, or core switch number one. So let's set up a naming convention for our office suites. <laughs> By this time, this diagram is begging me to give it some official documentation, but like that little shrimp on Finding Nemo, I must resist. We're gonna talk all about documentation later on. For now, I'm gonna go with the naming convention that was that first one of the better column on the previous slide. So this switch will become RT-ST4 for suite number four, dash S1, because it'll be the first one in that suite. Now you might be going, ah, what about its old name? It's gone. <laughs> I just put those on there to talk about them. That wasn't the official naming convention. This guy down here will become RTST4-S2 because it's the second switch in that suite. And these guys follow suit. RTST1 because it's suite number one, S2 on the bottom. And RTST1-S1 on the top. So let's come back to our network and do it. Get these guys typed up. Print. Cut these all up. Good. All right, now let's get them stuck on the switch. Now, depending on the kind of switch that you have, you may not have the kind of flexibility that I have right now to put a big old label right there at the middle of the switch because you might have a 48 or 52 port switch. You just gotta get creative with your label and maybe slice it really thin and put it down here, shrink that font size. The key is to have it somewhere visible on the front of the device. Hmm. I didn't think I planned on running into a switch that's too large this soon. Both of these are 52 port switches. Hang on. So I printed these guys much smaller so that I could trim off all the excess. There we go, that should fit. I'm gonna squeeze it in right on the bottom left right here. There we go. And then get this guy up here. And we're done. Not too bad if I do say so myself, although Switch 1's label is slightly crooked and that's gonna bother me for the rest of my life when I see it. I would say we've safely reached a functional conclusion. Now we've got the physical labeling done, but we still need to do the configuration that sets the host name on the device. To do that, we're gonna bring in PuTTY, which is an amazing free Windows application, telnet into each one of these devices, and set the host name. This is where it gets pretty fun. Put in that first IP address, 10.225.1.240. I'm actually gonna save that session under the name that I plan on assigning it, RTST1-S1. And I'll click save right here, so it's forevermore stored in my history and click on open. It's asking for my username, I'll type in Cisco and the password I've given it. And I'm now sitting here on switch OD5411 in privilege mode. I'm gonna move to global configuration mode, configure terminal, and type in hostname rt-st1-s1. Enter. Oh, good grief. Hit the up arrow, enter, there we go. And I can see the prompt is now changed rtst1-s1 at every single prompt on this switch. Now I'm gonna save that configuration. Copy running config, startup config, and yes, save it. And repeat that same exact process for all four of the switches in this network.
and there you have it. All the switch names are now set to the standard that we created. Now, because I did that in hyperspeed, I wanted to just show you that I'm going to new session every single time, going to the previous one that I put in there, hitting load, so I get the previous IP address, just changing the IP address to whatever is going to be next, obviously, type in the valid IP address, then type in the new name of the one that I'm saving, save it, connect to it, change the name, save the config, and done. <laughs> Now I said at the beginning of this nugget that you will be able to design and configure a naming convention for your Switch network. So the hands-on exercise aligns with that exactly. Develop and implement a naming convention for your Switch infrastructure. Let me encourage you, don't get lazy. It's easy to just say, eh, Switch 1, Switch 2, Switch 3, Switch 4, that sounds good to me. No, 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 really think it through. Add it to your network diagram. That's what we've been building this entire time. This is going to transform into some official documentation in just a moment. And that, my friends, is developing a network device naming convention.